So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Fan, and I will be your MC for today. A warm welcome to everyone to the ASEW webinar series eight, brought to you by the ASEAN Sustainable Energy Week, or ASEW, the ASEAN largest international conference, exhibitions, and renewable uh, efficiency and environmental electric vehicle. So due to the ongoing of the COVID-19 in Thailand, the organizer has done the decision under the considerations of the safety of the, all of the trade show participants. So this physical trade show shall be rescheduled to next. In the meanwhile, uh, we will continue to provide uh, more solutions for the industry and community through our online event during 14 to 16 October, 2021. So we are sure that this will help our community sustain the critical business conversation and engagement. So today's webinar is organized by the King Mongkut Institute of Technology Lakarbang, the Data Center University .org, King Mongkut University of Technology Thonburi, and the Joy Graduate School of Energy and Environment together with Informa Markets in Thailand. So we will be discussed under the topic of the renewable energies for Thailand Data Center, Since the COVID-19 pandemic has increased the demand on data center business, it has enabled digital commerce and online meetings and other which making the digital infrastructure, uh, infrastructure more important than ever. As the data center consume a large amount of energy, today our speaker will share their expertise about the growth and opportunities to apply the renewable energy in the data center business. Before we start, I would like to quickly mention on um, the webinar rules. So as you can see that all the microphone and uh, camera will be uh, visible for the whole of this webinar. So if you wish to ask any questions to our speaker, please go to the Q&A box below and don't forget to mention our speaker name so we can know that which question we should address to. And if you have any internet connection problems during this webinar, so we also are live as the ASEAN Sustainable Energy Week Facebook. So you can go on that and you can just simply share your um, this webinar to your connections. So um, I would like to have, uh, to, well, I would like to thank you to uh, our sponsors for today's webinar. So the sponsor for today's webinar is Schneider Electrics. We empower all the all to make the most of their energy and resources and ensuring life is on everywhere for everyone at every moment. So without any further delay, I would like to welcome uh, our moderator for today. So he is Professor um, Mon, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Monpri Vibunrat. So he is the professor at the Kim Mung Kut uh, Institute of Technology Lakarbang Business School. And also, uh, he is working as a, in a academic services for Engineering Institute of Thailand as a data center standard committee at the same time as VC Thailand country chair. So his interest is on the research, just, uh, data center system reliability, data center uh, energy efficiency, cloud uh, computing, IoT, smart city, smart grid, waste energy, renewable energy, and business continuity continuity management. So he has a very long experience in this sector. So I will do sure that uh, Mr. Uh, our moderator will be moderate the session is very interesting. Okay, so I would like to pass uh, this floor to Dr. Monpre to moderate the session after this. Good uh, afternoon, Ms. Uh, Dr. Monpre. Okay. Uh... Welcome everyone because time zone is made different. So just welcome all, all the audience to this webinar series number eight. We talk about renewable energy for Thailand data centers. Uh, before we go, I would like to uh, introduce uh, just a uh, brief for our uh, guest speaker today. The first will be Mr. Wong Kawin. Uh, he is uh, managing director from DC1. Uh, he is, uh, have more than 30 years experience with data center, and he is uh, keen on this. That, that's why uh, I invite him to join with us. We know each other more than 10 years already. And the second uh, is Dr. Kanchit. You can open your 
uh, video. Dr. Kanchit, uh, he's an expert uh, level 12 on power plant, electric, electric uh, on power plant, he is from EGAT or Electricity Governor Authority of Thailand. He has a long experience and he is uh, a lecturer at the Chiang Mai University as well. And he is he's always my guest on the power generations. And the last one, uh, Mr. Abe, he is a white president and secure power from China Electric Thailand. And he also cover Myanmar and Laos as well. He is an uh, expert in the data center part behalf of uh, technologies owner as well. Okay, that's all for our speaker today. Okay, before we get to about a uh, topic that I think quite interesting topic. So they have the new generations about concern about the climate change. Like we know about global warming, we see many disaster happen. I think last week we saw a big disaster flooding in China. That may be cause of the human act to the nature. It's like a movie avatar. You want to destroy to get the resource and then the nature fight back. So they have a report from the clean power past that they have about the volunteer standard called the future of internet power or we call FOIP. They have a working group that uh, started talking about the renewable energy buyer alliance or RIBA that will be hundreds of uh, large organization corporation join with them. So I may talk about a few cases that we talk about uh, data center transition to greener energies. I we have two cases to share with you like uh, Facebook. They have a claim with the digital reality, clean energy purchasing agreement that Facebook, uh, they, they, they're working together with digital reality. About eight megawatt solar farm that involved in North Carolina. And that will be on the US side. And on the uh, Europe side last year, uh, side last one, they have uh, announced that there will become a carbon neutral within 2030s. So in the future, we will see about the virtual power purchasing agreement that already discussed with, with this one, which the mean renewable, renewable energy credit, or we call RECs, will uh, emerging soon. That is important because of we talk about virtual power purchasing agreement on the smart grid that uh, Dr. Kachit will be chair about this one. Okay, so many companies have been concerned about this one, even though from the European side, as everyone knows, uh, according to uh, industrial hosts like uh, Ireland, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Google, or even though Microsoft, they are all there to gaining about uh, free cooling. So they try to save more power over there as well. So I will get to the, our first speaker, Mr. Wong Carvin, to share the idea about how the data center and renewable energy can live and become one of ecosystem. Okay, please welcome uh, Mr. Wong Kavin. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Montre. Okay. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my presentation will be broken into two, two different approaches. One is whereby we are looking at uh, buying renewable energy or electricity from our su existing supplier. Now they're going to be available in certain countries. So I'm going to talk about a, a globe, uh, share my experience across multiple countries before I dropped in on Thailand itself as well. The other approach is actually taking control of our own faith and actually trying to analyze is there another way to power. Uh, use look at renewable generation of power within the data center itself, either working in partnership, uh, like an EPC program. So there are two broad approaches that we are going to be talk that I'll be talking about. Now, but at this point in time, one of the things I want to make clear is that we are talking about renewable energy usage. So we are not talking about efficiency. That's a completely different aspect of what we want to do in the industry. Uh, 
covered with uh, how we're going to use energy more effectively and more efficiently. We're going to discuss about how do we go after, uh, uh, what is our future strategy in every country that we work in, and in this case for Thailand, what's available out there, and what options can a data center uh, business take with, with, within, within, the, within our control. So let me talk about the first approach, which is talking to our current providers and and intimately to, to discuss with them what are their future plan on converting uh, their current uh, way of producing energy to be more renewable based. Now, one of the first things I want to talk about is that actually it's not about renewable electricity, it's about the renewable fuel that they use to create electricity. So you go back down to what fuel does the power generation plant use and that would determine whether the electricity is green, is blue, or is brown with carbon base. So there are multiple ways that these are now available. These are now available. You need to talk to your power supplier. You need to engage with them and in any country that you work with, depending on the regulation and who's in charge there. So for example, renewable energy is not new actually, to be honest with you, for example, in uh, some countries that, uh, that are dialing in today, you have what I call traditional renewable energy, for example, uh, nuclear power is considered renewable. It is actually no carbon footprint on it. The other one more, which is older than, than, than nuclear energy is actually hydro. Hydro, any electricity produced by hydro dam are technically renewable. So if you look at all this uh, aspect, you now know that you can actually get renewable energy from existing supplier. The key, however, is to make sure that there's an audit process that comes out of the grid to say what percentage of that electricity you're buying is actually generating from a hydro dam. How do you know, how can you trace it back to the source of the production so that when you actually buy it from your supplier, he can prove, there's a proof of, there's a proof of certificate to say, hey, 60% of this electricity you're buying is coming from one of the hydro dam, the other 40% is not. So these are the current engagement that power providers uh, in, in different countries are already discussing. And some of them are using blockchain technology in order to show proof to uh, buyers like us to be able to say, look, Carbon, you know, you, you, are, you have proof that 60% of your energy is renewable based. Now, this is really important because one of the outcome that's gonna come in the next couple of years in quite a lot of country in Asia, would be government will institute a carbon tax. Um, you can either show them that, hey, 60% um, of my energy is renewable, so my carbon tax could be reduced. Or, so do you need a proof, a, a piece of paper to prove that that's what it is? So industry buyers and seller must work together in order, and the government agency, in order to make sure that we have all these things properly put together so that people know what they're buying and they can show proof in order to know that they're fulfilling it. Uh, the other method is of course, buying your carbon credit to offset the rest of 40%. So these are different, these are implementable strategies that exist for a lot of us. That it, it's a matter of putting this together and, and, and executing it. So let me get down to Thailand. For example, I'm aware I went for a really interesting visit, was invited uh, to Laos. And, and as part of my study to understand what, how my industry is gonna to have to evolve, I find out that uh, actually um, Thailand has a very major contract that buys a significant amount of hydropower from specific dam, a specific hydropower people in, in Laos and, and, and they actually ship that uh, in a dedicated um, trunk line to bring it back straight across the border into, into Thailand. So under these circumstances, this becomes easily trackable with some kind of system. So I, I can tell, tell you now that with the right discussion and motivation, uh, I believe that they, they, it is available for data centers who are serious. It won't be cheap, but it's probably cheaper than, than nuclear power <coughs> and cheaper than solar for sure. Uh, and these, these are the criteria that we look at in order to be able to buy certain renewable energy profile uh, as, as part of our electricity program. So essentially that's the, that's the buy approach, right? Whereby you talk to them. The other thing that's available, again, uh, let's talk about in Thailand and, and, and other geography too, there are certain deregulation in the energy board, whereby for example, in Thailand, especially 
industri some industrial park are, are given license to generate their own power. Now, of course, the current way they generate the power is still using gas or whatever form, so it's not renewable. But having said that, if they are already using gas to generate power, the other gas that's also available, it's a market that's developing in Thailand for, for, for certain, is hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen can be created from natural product, uh, from manufacturing plant that do aluminum smelting. And I believe hydrogen is available as a gas to be, to be bought and sold in, in Thailand. So some of these future element could include um, hydrogen generators, right? You, you have, in this private uh, industry, I said, they have their own power plant. And they, they, use, they use big commercial generators to generate power and they're all gas-based gas generator. And I'm aware that these gas-based generators, natural gas-based generators, you can also ask and buy them that will actually operate with hydrogen. So on that basis, it is possible in the future that some of these self-generation capability can transfer the, the, the fuel source from carbon-based fuel to non-carbon-based fuel. And by doing that, you now instantly have the ability to provide renewable power on site. So this is the other alternative strategy that definitely is, is available to, for us to consider in Thailand. And possibly in other ASEAN economy, I have not investigated, but definitely. Uh, but I have also spent, been invited to, to Japan to Hokai, by the Hokkaido prefecture. And Hokkaido is the one of the, the only major prefecture in, in Japan that actually produces a large part of this energy uh, using renewable main. The two source is wind and solar. It's got one of the largest solar, solar pa uh, power farms I've seen uh, in, in Asia. And um, I haven't seen the China one, but they are very large and, and they are producing it. And But the interesting thing in my discussion with them is that to regulate the flow, you know, there's a time when the wind stops or the sun stops, and but you need to produce continuous energy into the grid so that you can buy it off. They actually design what they call one of the world's largest battery I've ever seen. It's housed in one million square feet, uh, is, a, is a big data center, and it's actually a flow battery. And using that, they could regulate the uh, power source of both the wind and the solar and push it into the grid. Now, on that basis, it's of course more, more costly than if you were using hydro nuclear. Okay, so therefore it, the price of electricity of renewable electricity in Hokkaido is a reflection of the strategy they put together. But again, these examples of how power generators, whether privately owned or the traditional incumbent, um, there is the ability to, to start switching over to a renewable energy, a renewable a fuel source in order to generate energy into the grid. So I hope that gives you a big picture of, of renewable and, and it's not the existing technology, as I said. So hydro and nuclear has been a long time and therefore the cost is very manageable depending on which country you're at, whether it is available or not. Um, and, and the other new one would be solar and wind, which is a lot newer and not, not as higher cost per se, because you need to put the battery into place in order to regulate the constant flow of, of energy. So on that basis, I hope you, you have an idea that, uh, that there is available uh, option for you to talk and engage in dialogue and, and, and socialize with your service provider, your energy service provider, at least to determine the next three year strategy. So we can look forward to, to renewable in the next three to five year gap. And I, I believe that's so in, in different country. And in Thailand, I believe it's gonna be sooner than, than, than that based on what I can see. But the, 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 the next speaker will be able to deal with it in more detail than me. I, I see a, a, a doctor from EGAT and he would hopefully be able to share more light to what I've just said. The other thing that we want to talk about is that if we were gonna produce it ourselves, meaning as a data center, we decided, hey, we, more than looking at renewable energy, can we use renewable energy incentive as a way to rethink our electrical strategy? Now that is a totally different thing, but it works. Remember this, it's not about renewable energy, it's about renewable fuel. 
So one of the major fields that the world is talking about today that is consistent and that can produce power consistently is actually hydrogen. Uh, it's, it's a gas like uh, natural gas. So if we can manage natural gas, you can manage hydrogen. Uh, no, more, no more dangerous than natural gas, uh, but you still need to manage it. Now, and therefore in the data center industry, we also have technology that now can convert directly, uh, not just using this approach for renewable energy, we can change the design structure of how what, what, what how we're going to deliver power to a data center. So I'm sharing with you the concept of a hydrogen-driven data center. Basically, we can take away, basically, we will produce the power ourselves, we will put in hydrogen, and we'll use hydrogen fuel cell. That technology has evolved from very small fuel cell that was designed for cars. And today, in Europe and, and Asia, a fuel cell size are, are going up to about one megawatt per module to two megawatt per module. And there are some very interesting investors in very large company that have invested in this capability to pro pro provide what I call industrial size fuel cell. The Americans, on the other hand, have been using natural gas fuel cell. So the fuel cell technology, again, is not new. It exists. It has been here for the last five to six years. There are some major trials going on in the United States using natural gas. The Europeans are ahead on the hydrogen fuel cell, and the Asian, uh, we, I, from what I'm understanding, they are high, we are looking at hybrid between hydrogen and, and, and natural gas. Now, that's very impactful from a data center perspective. That's a decision we take. It's nothing to do with buying renewable power. It's about changing the idea of how we're going to deliver power to our data center. Now, when you do that, two things happen. Primary power becomes your control, so you don't have a gen set to do backup. Your backup becomes the grid. Now, in Singapore, uh, they have introduced the, the power company has introduced uh, plans where I can buy backup power from the grid. It makes a lot of sense. So in this case, um, then this may be available in different areas where you're operating. You know, I know you're all some of you are from different countries. You got to find out from the regular point of view: is it possible to buy backup power? So only when your primary source fails, you then draw from the grid. So essentially, this approach allows you to change the entire strategy of your your electrical system. And now, right now, that means you take away the genset, you take away the UPS because. Basically, fuel cell is a DC current, so you take it straight into your customer zone. Um, and the way to design data center, hydrogen-based data center, again, is, is a different way of doing it, and, and that's where the, the future could be. So I have now presented very quickly two different views and approach that the industry can take. And, and the nice thing is that it's, it's, this decision is, is currently within the... Um, the consideration of each data center company that, that they need, need to take. It is not something that is enforced against us. We have an option. And whatever makes sense to us from a business perspective, uh, that may be the direction we will go. And that would depend on which country we are operating in as well. So the strategy will be different. So on that basis, I'm going to um, end my little pitch and, and, and open myself for question in, later on. Thank you, Dr. Montri. I'm going to pass okay. it back to you, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, good Kevin. I think that would be a good uh, perspective from the expert in data center fields. And at the same time, I already talking about the virtual power purchasing agreement that will be applying to the renewable energy credits. You will see this one in the future. I have been trying to push this one and talk to the uh, governor of the power in Thailand. That data center in the future will be the, another major load in the power development plan or PDP of Thailand. As I make a research about almost about two to five years right now, I have collected the load of the data center from the government side and for the private side is almost five to 700 megawatt right now in Thailand. That means we talk about five dams that to, to support this load in the future as well. So the renewable energy can become any source like uh, hydrogen or even though we have electro, uh, hydroelectrics a lot and we have solar floating, we have solar roof or we have about uh, wind. But 
Uh, I think the another guest speaker, uh, Dr. Kanchit, is from ECAT. I think he has more information to discuss with all of you to, uh, to know more detail about how capability of the uh, power grid and how much renewable energy uh, in Thailand we have. Okay, welcome, Dr. Kanchit. Uh, can, yes. Can you try? Oh, okay, okay, I will pass uh, this one for you. Okay. Okay. Good day uh, for our participant. So uh, my part is on like uh, hydropower for um, renewable energy, but uh, in case of hydropower for Thailand data centers. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, let me minute this a little bit. Okay, I'm going to give you like a two point of view. First one is like uh, to give some idea of uh, how we develop uh, renewable energies and in case of hydropower in Thailand. So uh, some of uh, participants from, from Thailand may know this really well a little bit, but I just need to, uh, to uh, give you some background. And after that, uh, I'm going to propose the concept that uh, Actually, this is one of my uh, research uh, that I'm going to do. So I'm not sure that I can uh, let me manage with this with my slide. Oh, Dr. Bunty, uh, can you see my slide? Yes, we can see. Thank okay. you. Okay. So uh, I think all of you may know uh, about myself very well. So um, just, I, I just want to explain that this is uh, only my uh, point of view. Uh, this may not, uh, may not reflect to the views of uh, IWDPS where I'm doing as executive committee and also my organization and some information is, uh, is still in the process of uh, R&D. As I already mentioned, I'm going to give you some two point of view first start with hydropower development in Thailand. And so Dr. here is Dr. the... Kantrit, uh, sorry to interrupt. I think your presentation is uh, not in the fifth screen. Okay. I suggest you to... Is it okay now? Uh, uh, let me share. Uh, okay. Okay, during Dr. Kanchit fix the screen, uh, uh, we, okay, you can use on this mode that, that. Is this okay now? Yes, okay. Okay. This is okay now. Okay, so the install capacity of uh, gen our generation in Thailand is about 5,000 megawatt, but the, uh, uh, with the peak of about 3,000 megawatt. So uh, as you know that the uh, off install capacity uh, are not running at the same time. But in the meaning, uh, in the means of full outside, there are, we are going to, uh, let me show. So uh, we, there, there are many types of fuel, of fuel that we use in, in the country, mainly from natural gas, about 65, uh, 56%. And uh, we also use our own domestic coal for 9.2% uh, imported coal for about 3% fuel oils a little bit and very little from diesel and we also need to purchase some minute, uh, some energy from neighboring country but from renewable side it's about 7, uh, 7 about 28 uh, 28% 28 of uh, our generation let me check. So you can see that uh, of, uh, for this uh, um, 28, mainly come from domestic hydropower that uh, most of them belong to, uh, owned by ECAT uh, I'm working with. And there are some imported hydropower from neighboring country, mainly from Laos, about 8%. And uh, there are 
these are other renewable energy source, mainly from uh, solar power, about 5.7%. 5, 5 so uh, in Thailand, we are planning, we are planning, uh, we are set up like uh, what we call power development plan or PDP. And um, on renewable point of view, uh, the rated P PDP that we call PDP uh, 2018, revision one, uh, we are going to promote or increase the renewable source into about uh, 32.5% in 2037, and uh, mainly come from solar, wind, and the other come from uh, come from other type of renewable energies. In the midst of uh, ECAT, that uh, that we are also part of um, gener uh, generating organization that we are going to develop some renewable energies uh, that we can do by ourselves the first uh, but you can hear from many source that we are going to we are we have been developed the project that we call solar putting solar with hydro we are because we have we own uh, or we manage uh, many reservoirs that belong to the hydro power plant uh, throughout the countries we start the first project already in in one province in northeastern part of Thailand, about 45 megawatt. This is the project timeline that uh, all together in 2037 that we are going to develop about 16 projects in nine existing dams. All together at the end, we are going to have 2,725 megawatt. But this is like uh, not the uh, not the increasing capacity, but uh, uh, we are going to install the same capacity that uh, existing dam already generate power, like uh, uh, one dam, for example, at silicate hydropower. We all together we have already 500 megawatt at the existing uh, generation. So we just um, uh, add another five megawatt as uh, like another. Uh, additional to that press, but at the same time, they generate just about 5,000, uh, 500 megawatt from, from that source. So this is like a kind of, uh, um, the final picture is uh, for each side, they are going to generate just that um, amount of, uh, of their existing power, but uh, solar, putting solar power is like a kind of a backup to, to make it more flexible and more stability to the system. So all together with that, we also have like a small hydropower development project. In PDP 2018, I mean the first revision, we already planned for three hydro, small hydropower at allocation dam for, for these three sites. All together is about uh, 34.5 megawatt. And the rest we are going to develop about 24 project of 69 megawatt, it is like a kind of a small hydropower scale altogether to uh, 2037. So this is also part of uh, uh, the main part of hydropower development in Thailand. And uh, this is also another interesting uh, information about hydropower. In Thailand, we also have like uh, three existing pump storage hydropower as you can see from the slide, that uh, that three altogether is about uh, 1,531 megawatt located in uh, very close to to center of Thailand, and we are planning to develop another uh, 800 megawatt in northeastern part of Thailand in the near future. So this is to ensure that uh, there are some uh, position on hydropower development in Thailand to to make uh, the system more flexible and more stability in the means of uh, uh, power system operation. So this picture is like uh, the existing power system in Thailand that we, uh, uh, most of generation come from ECAT, but we also have our IPP, SPP, 
uh, that what we call private power producers uh, categorized, categorized in, uh, in, the, in the amount of the capacity that they generate and connect to the kit. And the power kit uh, itself belongs to ECAT. And we have two distribution utility called Provincial Electric City Authority and also Metropolitan Electric City Authority that take care for distribution uh, uh, system. And we, so we also have a con, uh, consumer site. So this is what we are now in uh, at, uh, at this time. So um, as uh, Dr. Manti and uh, Mr. Wong Kevin mentioned about the data center, if we have for additional data center, but I know that there are some there are some small data center already uh, implemented in Thailand that Dr. Monty may tell you a little bit on on that. But uh, I mean, in in the near future, there are, there will be many data center planning uh, implemented in Thailand, and there is another opportunity that uh, we can um, we can uh, at least uh, supply from supply side data center need. Need, need to to get power from the system. Uh, but what we are planning now is we are applying uh, this kind of technology that we call blockchain technology to, especially for renewable energy. This is for supervising renewable energy power generation and consumption in the bulb in almost real time. Uh, I, I just need to explain a little bit about uh, about uh, the um, I mean the, um, the idea that we are going to, to use. So the blockchain technology is like uh, you know that it is a mechanism for creating touch data on the internet and is well known as a fundamental technology for virtual currency. But its application is expected to spread beyond the financial sector because of the following features. Like uh, the first one is tempering can be easily detected and data can be tracked, especially all related assets can be converted into information and, dis and distribution managed. So uh, this, uh, the application in the power industry is also con is considered the most promising research and uh, research and development are underway around, around the press, including in Thailand. So uh, the shift to renewable energy source to curb global warming is accelerating rapidly. Uh, the digitalization of renewable energy sources have become a must for cooperation. So there are many challenges in popularizing renewable energy uses. I have forgot on two challenges related, related to, to uh, its distribution. One difficulty is handling renewable energy source. The amount of energy generated by by any kind of uh, source like a solar, wind, or hydro, especially solar and wind is unstable, and it is difficult for uh, uh, distribution power company to procure stable electricity. And the other is the cost associated with proving that the energy come from, as a uh, Wong already mentioned, especially from renew renewable source, and additional overhead not required by other power generator. If the source of uh, renewable energy can be verified by evidence in the blockchain itself, you said will become more widespread because the additional proving costs can be eliminated. Uh, that should be uh, lowering the price of uh, renewable energy in, in the final picture. So that means uh, we can uh, we can apply the kind of the technology to um, to our system in, in the near future and doing a, and doing as for sure power purchase agreement as Dr. Munti mentioned uh, at the beginning. So I believe that uh, the blockchain technology may help solve these two challenges accordingly. So uh, this is the um, uh, another kind of concept that we, we are going to supervise where renewable energy is generated, especially from hydropower. This is what we are uh, uh, that uh, that I already mentioned from the beginning. So uh, the aim of this concept is to activate the system such as uh, the platform for uh, energy trading. You can see from the picture that uh, we can use uh, this kind of concept for 
uh, doing that, allocating the power to, cus to customer, po uh, proving the percentage of uh, source of especially renewable source in the power use, and so uh, proving the power source from the beginning. But this is a kind of uh, like a conceptual framework that we are, uh, that especially myself, that uh, we are going to, to, to do more, more research for the uh, um, interviews of our technical concerns. Fortunately, in Thailand, uh, as you know, that we, uh, the, the system of power system uh, of the power electric city uh, structure is like a kind of uh, enhancing a buyer. But we are going to like uh, to move to competitive mar market approach in the near future, like uh, uh, what we are going now. We are going to do now is like to set up a kind of a third party access or TPA framework that uh, regulate by electric city uh, by electric city regulate, uh, regulator committee. So and this should be uh, make. Uh, the concept that uh, that I had uh, de delivered to our view uh, is going to be uh, feasible in the near future. I, and I heard that some of uh, some part of the framework we are going to do like a kind of uh, private per, uh, per power project agreement uh, in some area to use. Um, this, uh, this is kind of a, like a pilot project, and we can use just kind of that pilot project to adjust the framework there we are going to, uh, to use in the near future. So that's all for my side. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, presentation. That's very interesting because of this is the heart of today webinar. I would like to show you because if you see the number at the first page that Dr. Kanchis presents, we have almost 14 gigawatt to support on the renewable energy. However, renewable energy, they have two parts that mean firm and non-firm, right? Because from right. the Dr. Kanchit information, we have 16 dam, we have nine dam, and then 16 project, almost 2.7 gigawatt. And we have hydro pump, another 1.5 gigawatt. So that means we have five gigawatt to support on renewable energy that is firm. So that's project it could be because this is my research as well, because them is depend on the location, but the grid, how we can make a smart and how can we perform the blockchain to be the key to exchange, like I mentioned, we call virtual uh, PPA. PPA and we try to create a renewable credit to the data center. Yeah, so right. this is a mechanism or, or concept that we discussed today. And I think they have many data centers uh, in this webinar, or even though in uh, many countries, if you're interested, you can come and discuss with us because from another part of me, I'm a, a full-time lecturer I'm doing about this research all the time. So the key with that, Dr. Kanchit, uh, talking about blockchain, this will be connected to the virtual PPA. So we still have uh, the next speaker that will be uh, Mr. Abe, he's from Schneider. He is uh, more experienced in the data center or even though uh, Schneider have many uh, use case in many countries around the world. So welcome uh, Mr. Abe to us about uh, the good case and the use case from Schneider. Sorry, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and hello all who are in the different time zones. So my name is Abai and uh, I'm responsible for data center business for Thailand, Myanmar and Laos. And uh, before this, uh, the experts have shared the views and uh, how Thailand is, uh, is coping up and creating themselves to support the renewable energy uh, stream and how we can, how we can uh, really support our customers in Thailand to set up data centers and also uh, ensuring that these data centers are sustainable. Right? So let me quickly share my screen and uh, I will run through 
your slides. Just let me know once you see my screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Can you make it uh, bigger? Okay. Give me a minute. Is it better now? Okay, good, okay. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, what we are seeing right now uh, in the industry, all these data centers uh, where sustainability is one of the key criteria for uh, a data center. And this framework is become very essential for all the large scale data centers, which is deployed uh, all across the globe. And in fact, uh, it's not what, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not an option right now because all the C level at all the industries, up to 99% of CEOs are looking at sustainability as a key criteria. And as you can see, the industries, the countries are also supporting uh, uh, sustainability as a criteria for their uh, GDPs. So half of the world is really uh, now investing and the nations are coming towards this to ensure that there's a zero carbon emission uh, ascent, uh, attained by the country level. And of course, uh, the investors are also looking at it, uh, and they're also ensuring that when you put a proposal to the investors, whether the uh, sustainability is one of the criteria and the zero carbon emission is also one of the denominator, which is considered uh, while uh, sponsoring or investing into any specific project. Now, uh, what we want to do is we don't want to live behind. Uh, in other countries across the globe, in US, in Europe, we just discussed uh, by, by Kevin as well as uh, Dr. Point, that people are really looking at it already. People are looking at uh, using the uh, uh, renewable energy to ensure that we have uh, greener data centers. The laws have been deployed uh, where we are able to create sustainable data centers using different types of uh, energies and reducing the carbon footprint. And uh, at Thailand also, this is where you just seen from EGAT that we are making efforts towards uh, ensure that we are not left behind. And today, uh, it is not just a topic. So, a few of the top five uh, industry experts are already deploying uh, their criteria, and the, the, these industry leaders are already committed towards delivering the sustainable data center uh, environment. And uh, they are offering this to their customers as well to ensure that they are able to meet the uh, the carbon neutrality within their infrastructure. We at Schneider also, uh, we have deployed few tools where uh, you can see this is something which we have uh, on our website where you can just log in and look at the uh, data center versus the edge global energy forecast footprint. And by putting some criteria, uh, you can play with it. This is our view that you will see the edge data centers. Now this is becoming a, a buzzword today that a lot of small scale data centers to increase the latency are forming uh, the, the, the industry department. And we are seeing that these data centers are becoming more and more power hungry. That means they are going to deploy, they're going to use, utilize a lot of power while uh, we are going in the future into data center business. This is available for the free on the website. You can just log in into it and uh, check by yourself by changing numbers. But most of the time, what we have seen, the edge is going to eat more and more power in the data center segments. And uh, when you look at the sustainability criteria, you will see there are many buzzwords around. Uh, Renewable is one of it. And uh, there are 52 such buzzwords which are being uh, focused right now in uh, data center segment. And uh, a few of them we have already spoke about. And uh, there are many, many more which will come in future as we go into this specific journey of how to make uh, data center sustainable and carbon neutral. Of course, fundamentally, we will look at uh, four specific aspects of it where water, how we ensure that we utilize water uh, uh, properly and uh, sustainably, uh, land and soil, forests. Of course, we need to have a more greener uh, atmosphere around it. And of course, the atmosphere, which is basically where the CO2 or, or, or the greenhouse emission, gas emissions are being impacting our uh, environment. 
and this is actually impacting our global warming scenario as well. So in this scenario, we will look at a few of the uh, data center concepts. So we have seen, we have studied that data center is moving towards more and more efficiency, uh, more and more efficient data center where PUE was used one of the criteria to calculate uh, the data center efficiency. And we are seeing a lot of data centers uh, across the globe are improving. So we are, we are getting better, we are getting efficient. We are arguably uh, becoming more and more uh, uh, aware of what, how to make our data center more efficient. But is data center efficient? Efficiency is the only criteria to be considered, uh, which we think uh, it's, it's, not, it's not the only criteria. The efficiency, of course, is a part of a sustainability, but it is not the, uh, the ultimate aim of how the data center sustainability should be achieved. So it's basically, this is where uh, we need to ensure and focus that we are covering the carbon emission footprint. We are reducing the, the carbon emission and we are running towards the carbon neutrality. So you can see there are multiple uh, atmospheric greenhouses which are currently being uh, absorbed by atmosphere and this is actually causing a uh, lot of impact. So there are types of uh, emissions which is scope one, scope two, scope three which are usually considered in a greenhouse emission uh, criteria in sustainability. Where in scope one is the direct emission. Uh, suppose if you are running a data center and you are running generators. So if you are, if you are running those diesel generators and throwing out the uh, carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. That's basically a scope one criteria, which is generated by yourself. Then we have scope two criteria, which is uh, basically generated by the supply authorities. So where you are supplying the energy from is, is the, is the uh, emissions, which is done by the supplying authority. And scope three is even wider, where they look at all your ecosystem. How your, how your logistics are operating, how your suppliers are operating, so whether they are also contributing to carbon emission. So nowadays, all the uh, bigger, in, uh, bigger industries and environment are really looking at it to ensure that they are able to control scope one, scope two, scope three of emissions and greenhouses uh, uh, emissions are being controlled. Of course, uh, there are big uh, players like Equinix, Facebook and Microsoft. They are already looking at it. They are already reporting uh, on their uh, media about how concerned they are about all these uh, three scopes and what are they doing about to control this all three scopes. So they are vocal, they are publicly uh, providing their data and they're ensuring that they are uh, putting towards, putting efforts towards uh, ensuring the, 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 the reduction of uh, the uh, green gas emissions. And of course, it's not only those industries, but also a uh, lot of other uh, authorities, the governing authorities are also pushing the data center industry to ensure that the industry is considering sustainability as one of their key criteria, in which renewable energy is also becoming one of the uh, one of the important target criteria to ensure that we are able to hit hit the uh, sustainability requirement for data center. So how how do we tackle it? So there are ratings, there are indicators, there are awards. But at Schneider, we when we talk about sustainability, we also take our own uh, sustainability challenges. And in fact, I'm proud to say that Schneider Electric has been uh, actively involved for the last 15 years to ensure that we are able to achieve the sustainability within our organizations so that we can contribute to the scope three emission uh, uh, sustainability criteria for our, data center, for our data center customers. So we have been uh, awarded systematically by all the uh, agencies and all the committees. And uh, this year, we have been awarded as one of the most sustainable organization uh, Fortunate Electric, and uh, this is one of our uh, uh, good achievement where we have done a lot of work towards it. And of course, this is just the beginning. Uh, we have commitment uh, by 2030, all Schneider operations will go uh, carbon neutral. And by 2035, we will be running all our factories by zero carbon. And this is where we are uh, moving towards uh, as, a, as, a, as a company as well. And we have taken this commitment towards as a company as well. So this is basically decided by our CEO. So what we suggest is the, the, the sustainability or the carbon neutrality criteria is basically a top-down approach where it has to be part of your organization culture so that we can push towards how to improve the, uh, the sustainability within the data center infrastructure. Again, uh, there are multiple philosophies which uh, we drive in. I, it's a very busy slide. I don't want to run it through. But critically, what we are trying to say that we are covering all our ecosystems uh, criteria to ensure that we are achieving the sustainability for our organization so that we can transfer that benefit to our customer, customers. 
Now, uh, we have set a few of the uh, bold action labels. I will not go through all of them. So we have looked at uh, how we can control all the uh, aspects about uh, uh, controlling the carbon emission and com controlling the uh, greenhouse carbon emission, greenhouse emission criteria. We have created, uh, we have worked with a lot of different agencies and they have created a lot of uh, documentations and surveys where uh, we are driving the sustainability for our customers. And uh, as an organization, we also, we are looking at different aspects where we are looking at data center design. We are looking at how we uh, procure all the raw material to build data center and also how we run the data center and how uh, the team is able to contribute towards this uh, sustainability criteria, right? And of course, uh, the buzzword is very important that it has to be a, a executive sponsor. So it has to be a top-down approach where uh, nowadays we are putting a dollar value to COP vision. So many organizations are looking at how much carbon dioxide or how much uh, greenhouse gases you are, uh, you are producing and what is the dollar value towards that. So that means you are getting impacted on your overall business strategies if you are not able to control your carbon uh, emissions or greenhouse gases. So there's a carbon cap given to a lot of our industries and that's becoming one of the key criteria while you're looking at the financial statement of any organization. So of course, uh, we are there, we are, we are there to support our customers. And in fact, uh, we have done our own uh, carbon neutrality as an, as an annually, we are reducing about 125 million tons of uh, CO2 from our uh, overall ecosystem. And we are trying to support our customers also in that specific journey. So of course, sustainability is one of the key criteria, but in this, as you can see, the carbon strategy where the CO2 emission or greenhouse gas emission is one of the key criteria. Renewable energy sources is also one of the very important topic, which we really need to focus while we are looking at data center build, operate, or even a data center uh, design, right? So this is one of our customer uh, from Norway. And uh, this customer uh, is using 100% renewable energy. And this is a zero carbon emission uh, uh, data center, which is deployed in Norway. So this is just for your uh, visualization. Okay, I'm not sure whether you're able to hear the sound. Yes, we can hear the sound. data center which we have in Norway uh, and uh, it's not only one but there are many such uh, which are especially in Europe uh, and the US of course where uh, we can use the uh, existing infrastructure to support the data center uh, but this specific data center is, is, is very well defined towards how renewable energy can be used and how the natural resources can be used to reduce the uh, carbon emission. Then of course uh, uh, one of the data center called eco data center this is also a more most efficient data center but this is basically focusing more on data center efficiency. And then we are also working with them how this technology can help towards reducing the, uh, the uh, carbon emission and uh, how this overall solution can support the uh, renewable energy infrastructure. And uh, this is one of the uh, uh, small scale edge data center, which is deployed in Europe. So you can see there are large scale data centers and small scale data centers all can be converted using the renewable energy uh, and the uh, carbon emission footprint criteria. So this implementation, so this efficiency implementation has to be done during the design phase. So we should, be, we should ensure that all the criteria are defined while design phase. So we look at how the design base is formed. But as you can see at the bottom grid, it's very important how we're gonna operate the data center. What are the technical components which are required as a part of data center? What is we want to achieve as part of this data center? 
I mean, what type of uh, scope emissions we are looking at, what type of criteria we're looking at to design the data center, and then why we really want to create this uh, data center design. So it's basically looking from the operator base to the operation base. So uh, we are looking at different strategies and criteria, and it is very outcome driven uh, approach where we put the data center architecture together so that we can uh, we are able to deliver the required uh, sustainability uh, criteria to our customer. So this design is basically we are trying to reduce the size, we are uh, trying to reduce the weight by optimizing the size of the equipment. So we don't put traditionally data centers when they design, they're designed for a full capacity or investment capacity where we are oversizing all the time. But now all the data centers are looking at optimizing the footprint, optimizing the size, optimizing the capacity so that we don't put extra burden on the electricity system. Of course, serviceability and second life, basically how we can reuse the material which are used in a data center segment to repeat back to the, uh, to the inception of data center. So that's, that's a key criteria which we are looking at at the design stage itself. Then of course, how we can buy renewable, renewable energy where there are organizations which are sourcing uh, the renewable energy we also have a lot of uh, stakeholder pressure on the organization where we need to ensure that we are able to deliver the renewable energy to the data center and uh, the economic drive and of course the reputation becomes one of the key criteria for large scale data center service providers. But of course, it is also becoming one of the key requirement for the investors to ensure that when they look at funding of the company, whether there is this criteria considered in their uh, total business case or not. Then we have uh, many attributes where we can look at it, how we can ensure we meet the certification criteria to ensure that we are able to connect. So we are able to control the, the, the on-site, which is scope one uh, carbon emission, the off-site, which is scope to carbon emission, where we can get the supplies from uh, the green gas generations. And of course, how we can get the, uh, the, the energy certification attributes towards the data center. So, of course, uh, the, the, the uh, uptime certification is there, which is required to ensure the, uh, the availability of data center. But of course, it's not looking at only efficiency, but they're also looking at sustainability of data center, that how the whole ecosystem can support to bring the data center more sustainable. And by using the, uh, the renewable energy criteria is becoming one of the key topic for all the data center supply service providers and uh, builders, right? So these are a few uh, portfolio approaches. So we look at the whole uh, prospect of the data center when we look at uh, our customer uh, criteria and we provide support to our customer to define uh, different uh, objectives of data center so that we are not only limiting ourselves towards the energy efficiency. When I say energy, it's not power efficiency. It's not PUE, it's basically the energy efficiency which is utilizing the right pooling, utilizing the right power, utilizing the right people which are operating this data center. And then look at all the purchase agreements which can be done towards meeting uh, the uh, uh, energy efficiency criteria and also the uh, green emission criteria, right? So what are the key takeaways? So what I want to deliver out of this presentation is basically we need to prioritize that how a sustainability becomes a very important criteria and how we put the landscape of our data center towards achieving this requirement. We should look at how we can control the scope two, scope three visions by mixing the right uh, approach towards powering up the data center and how we should ensure that the, the carbon emission should support the, the whole journey of uh, the supply chain of data center need to be monitored to ensure that we are able to achieve the carbon neutrality for the data centers. So that's what I have. Uh, I hope I have not gone over time. And thank you very much for your patience and uh, support. We are all there in Thailand. Uh, please do connect with us if you need any further information. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kunabe. Because of right now, uh, technology is the support about the future of change in the data center and the renewable energy, how to become uh, inside the data center. You saw the case from uh, uh, Scandinavian from Norway actually they take more free cooling outside to cooling the system, but they still need some power, maybe from hydro, but they have many cases like in Texas, they have the huge solar farm that's built for the data center only. But in Thailand, I think you saw the number already, as I already mentioned about, uh, about 14 gigawatt, we can do more than that. 
because of this is the point that I try to pinch it out to all the audience. I think they have many audience from uh, ASEAN country or from outside ASEAN or from US. If you are interested about this one, you can come and uh, discuss in personal with me. Uh, and mostly I'm do about the research part and designer data center as well. So come back to uh, Kun Karin. Uh, I mean, because we, we have about five, four, five questions and all answer already, right, Brian? Uh, no, I will answer them uh, live rather than Okay, time. okay, uh, sure, sure, okay. Uh, let me just go through it. The first, let me do reverse order. The one that I remember is about uh, how about building data center near near to the power plant. Actually, this is the, this has been the first re, first idea that was developed many many years ago, and that's in in uh, in the Scandinavian country. And that's where the big uh, the big guys uh, can I won't mention their name, but you know who they are. All the big uh, cloud guys. When they built the data centers, uh, one million square feet, the largest one I know in no in uh, I, I think it's in Norway or Sweden, and next to the power, next to the hydro dam. Now, why next to the hydro dam? And the reason is to take away transmission costs. There, uh, there are three major costs in electricity when you deliver it to you. I think uh, Doctor Doctor so shared with a very nice diagram the, the 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 actually the source of fuel, the price of fuel the power plant cost, and then the distribution cost. You add that three together, that's the total cost to deliver one kilowatt hour of, of electricity to you. So in the early days, the big data center were built near to the hydro dam, not because of renewable energy, but because of lower cost. The lowest cost of electricity is to be there because you take away, uh, uh, hydro is really cheap because the, there's no fuel cost. And if you build next to the hydro plant, then there's no transmission cost. So if you go and look at the pricing tariff in, in, in Scandinavia, normal tariff is actually quite high. But yet, if you talk to the providers and you talk to the data center organizer, when they build the data center near to the power company, uh, near to the power source, the price is completely different. It's, it, it's, it's taken all those things away. So that I hope that answered the question for the, the last question, Lars, uh, that yes, it, it is definitely something that's doable, but it is also counterintuitive because the data center um, today, based on today's world, the data center, because of performance, needs to have really, really good network. So if you're in the in the way, way, way near where the power plant is and you don't have a network, uh, so okay, you have good power, but you've got no network to connect for your customer, this is also a problem. And that's where you have to balance off, yeah? So uh, I hope that answered that first question. Uh, the second one is more complicated. Um, the, 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 there's a gentleman who asked about the, the hydro, uh, 10 megawatt um, uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cell data center. I, I cannot give you the full cost now. There are some commercial confidence issue with regards to me discussing actual number plus, but more importantly, we have not built the data center yet. We're doing design work. We're doing analysis work on a spreadsheet. I can say that the current technology, the current level of pricing of the technology for fuel cell, hydrogen fuel cell, uh, let me use the word hydrogen fuel cell as opposed to uh, natural gas because the pricing is different. Uh, for hydrogen fuel cell, the infrastructure cost is of course much more expensive than building your traditional UPS plus your genset and all that stuff uh, type of a scenario for now. But if you project the production cost of hydrogen fuel cell in the next five years, um, you will see you, that the general understanding in the industry uh, that it, is that this construction cost of fuel cell will start to drop in the next five years. Where else the, the technology that we are aware of, which is UPS and Genset, it is unlikely to drop. Okay, it's already at a point where we already know how the manufacturing process is. As a matter of fact, it may increase uh, because of copper pricing and things that are used to build it. Where else fuel cell is a chemical process. So there's very little part. So what I can tell you now that today, the capital cost of uh, using fuel cell is higher than if you use a traditional technology. The other, the, but in the future, that will change. That, that graph is going to change. So that's why it's something that most, a lot of operators will spend some time to investigate this technology. The second part is that the OPEX, the OPEX of maintaining fuel cell, you add it all up, 
because there are very little moving parts in fuel cell. It's mostly membrane and you need to change them. So we are now also looking at total maintenance costs. Then a total maintenance cost in a hydrogen fuel cell kind of environment will look very different from uh, the traditional data center. So there is a gain, there's a potential gain that we have if you look at the maintenance cost of data center when you move from the traditional approach to let's say a fuel cell based approach. The last one is the most difficult, which is the, the fuel. In the traditional approach, we buy electricity and therefore we have an electricity cost, uh, which is our OPEX, uh, which we then get the customer to pay back on. Now, in the, fuel, in the fuel cell approach, we are actually not buying electricity. We are generating our own electricity. What we're going to buy is the fuel, which is hydrogen. And for that, there's a reference market. So some market, by the way, Europe and America has reference, uh, and Canada has very good reference hydrogen market. We do need a lot of hydrogen. We haven't, uh, my team is still computing how many kilogram of hydrogen do you, do you need to process for a 24 hour of a one megawatt fuel cell uh, uh, power kind of like, we don't have the full mass, but hydrogen pricing has a direct impact on the final pricing of the service between a hydrogen based data center and the traditional data center. And basically if you look at the market today, there's a cost envelope from Asia, uh, nothing much in Asia, but mostly in Europe and US and Canada, it ranges from as low as a dollar, dollar US, per kilogram, all the way up to about $4 uh, per kilogram. I can tell you that it is all within the sensitivity gap of, uh, of the, uh, of uh, let's say, converting that into operating costs and therefore, is it effective? Yes, it could be. And uh, as long as it stay within that envelope, uh, we could be maybe marginally more expensive than uh, the current way of, of, of electricity, but definitely not cheaper than if you were buying completely hydro. Hydro electricity is still the cheapest and is renewable. <laughs> so I just want to make it very clear. Hydro, can, no one can beat hydro. So any yeah. country that has hydro cap cap capacity, uh, that's a good data center country. <laughs> okay, so hydro is the best. And um, in terms of effectiveness, in terms of cost. Uh, I hope that uh, answered the other gentleman's question about uh, one of the nice things about hydrogen fuel cell data center is that it is, we see that it's easy to, to scale because it's not like the other traditional data center where there are too many components to work with and you have a, a, a competing factor on how you want to scale. So most likely scenario is that you would scale based on one megawatt or two megawatt per component. And you build the data center to be 30 megawatt and you scale it at, at two megawatt block. And uh, this is currently uh, the model that my team is working. This is the most optimized way. We do not know yet, and, and therefore I cannot tell you. But uh, it's certainly some the, the thing that we're modeling right now uh, on, a, on a desktop basis. Okay. So I hope that answers. Thank you, Dr. Montre. Pass it back to you. I think still have the questions asked to uh, Dr. Kanchit. Uh, KK, you can uh, answer online to the audience. Yes. Uh, you mean the, uh, um, the answer that I already uh, replied? Yeah, yeah, uh, but probably. that is in personal that uh, many, many audience would like to. Oh, okay, to okay. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, let me, let me recheck. For example, uh, how much transmission and distribution charge expect, uh, expect for uh, virtual PVA through national kit? Uh, this is uh, under study to make uh, this fair to all stakeholder by uh, ERC, by regulator. So, uh, because there, there, are, there are some part that uh, there's some, there are some existing uh, transmission and distribution charge uh, that uh, came out that come out with uh, like a uniform tariff uh, at this moment. So in the near futures, the uh, we are uh, uh, the regulator is going to announce such kind of this, but uh, I cannot um, give uh, such kind of that figures now. But this is uh, under uh, this is under studying. 
and um, we, we get plan to apply hydrogen or ammonia as an NG storage solution for renewable energy. Yes, we are planning on that, but uh, like um, like uh, Dr. Uh, like Mr. Wong Kawin said, the price is still high, but we are looking for the appropriate technology that uh, like uh, to be included in our uh, future energy. But there are some like uh, what I mentioned in in my answer to to um, to one attendant that we have already uh, implemented the pilot project in in one of our pump solid area very close to Bangkok, and there are one uh, pilot project in micro grid scale in Igat is going to be implemented. So uh, we are looking for that. Uh, yeah, when we build the TPA framework, we become a commercial reality. At this moment, this need to be um, this need to be officially announced by ERC, but they are going to do like a such kind of uh, uh, set up TPA framework, and this is uh, this is under processing now. As I as I knew, they are going to do like a kind of a public hearing for all stakeholder to uh, and include all of that comment to uh, to be the first uh, TPA framework that they are, that they are going to um, to announce and uh, all together with uh, uh, with some pilot project that they are going to to do in next years. So I think uh, officially by by a few by a couple of years that they are going to be announced but you have to keep on checking with uh, the regulator so i think yep that's, that's all, all for my side okay so there, there still have some that questions like how much power required for data in singapore we see in thailand because of from the Thailand part, I have the information, but like not official, but from Singapore and Malaysia, we have to, to work it out with the local because a data center can have two parts for the government data center and for the private data center, right? So we combine two, so we know exactly how much power we, we need. But from the research from the US or around the world, we, we use about 2% of the power productions of all the world. That's the, the number we have. And for the, uh, the, uh, that questions that asked Kevin about the, the hydrogen, actually we have the traditional we call brown, right? We use the natural gas reforming, right? We still use yeah, with right. LNG. So, but the new technology we call electrolysis right now is under development, but the mm -hmm. cost for produce the, the green hydrogen still are more expensive. Right. right, because we need the cheapest uh, electricity to do electrolysis, right? For example, we have a solar farm, we use that one and then produce the hydrogen. But for my research, if you put two megawatt, you can get only one megawatt. It's not, it's not uh, worth enough yet, but we yeah. need to waiting for the new technology becoming. I think we will have another uh, web series they will be talking about hydrogen because I and Dr. Tanchit already discussed about the hydrogen series will come in soon. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That should be another big topic. <laughs> yeah, it will be another big topic. And for uh, Mr. Abe, because you see about the number of uh, renewable energy in Thailand about 14 gigawatt, what should we do about this one? <laughs> Yeah, in fact, uh, this is this is what brings uh, Thailand makes uh, this is what makes Thailand a very good place for uh, data center investment, right? And we can really look at how we can convert this as a strategy for a data center uh, service provider by by you know coordinating with EGAT by coordinating with all the industry uh, service providers to ensure that we are able to uh, you know look at the whole sustainability criteria and where the renewables can support to meet this uh, sustainability criteria expectation. And we are very well placed right now in Thailand to really deliver that output to our customers. Yes, uh, they have uh, another question coming, Dr. Kanchit, they're asking about the float 
floating, solar floating. Yes, uh, I saw that question already. Yeah, yeah. I think on Kern Ubon Rat is already uh, COD, right? That's right. This is the first, the first uh, 45 megawatt of floating solar, uh, according to, to the floating uh, solar, uh, putting uh, solar with hydropower pan uh, that uh, done by, by ECAT. And the question is why there are so many uh, projects concerning to this, and what about the um, the solar? How to implement such kind of that on land? Well, okay, I need to mention that first of all, uh, for uh, EGAT itself, we are taking care for all, all um, many hydropower plants that come to come together with uh, resources. So there are a lot of resources that we are going to look after. So this is the first uh, reason that uh, there are many unused surface of, of water that we can uh, implement. Uh, such kind of this concept on 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 the reservoir. This is the first one. And uh, in technical point of view, uh, the uh, the area that we use, if compared with uh, make, uh, one megawatt for floating solar and one megawatt for on land solar project, uh, I uh, I can say that it's reduced. The use of land is about about two times of, of of what we use on in land. This is this is uh, one of um, one of uh, benefit that uh, we are going to use, and uh, and uh, all together with the cooling of the solar panel itself as well. So, and um, as I already mentioned, that we have to responsible for many reservoirs, but we need to work, or we need to do like kind of collaboration with many uh, uh, government. Uh, sector that uh, actually they own the the, the real press like uh, uh, national park or maybe or maybe the um, or maybe some government sector that they have or forest the department of forest or for forestry for example so but anyway because we ECAT, we are like a state owned enterprise so. Um, it's quite very uh, particular to discuss with them, and uh, we are allowed to do that. This is uh, my answers. Okay, I give the another support uh, on uh, Dr. Kanchit because in hydroelectric we call firm, but for the solar floating is non firm. So That's we right. need uh, smart. Uh, we call the AI to predict. Like I, I used to uh, study uh, one project with uh, uh, Dr. Napon from Thammasat. He's from the uh, ITBD PS chapter. We need to know the future. For example, to know tomorrow how much the solar power we're going to produce, right? And even though uh, wind, uh, so we can predict for the future. And on the plan, we can use the non non firm. That means the renewable energy. That this kind of thing and cut the firm cost, that means like uh, uh, the uh, coal power plant or gas power plant try to reduce that one. That is uh, that project talking about. But for the data center, they need the power all the time. So that's the question come back to the Carwin. Because we have the hydroelectric in Thailand and we have almost about five gigawatt to supply. So that means we have the firm, the power to supply to the data center. That is the topic in the future. I try to make this as national agenda to talk with the power authorities or BOI who support on the data center uh, industrial, like a foreigner, if you want to come to invest in Thailand, what the benefit you can gain from use the renewable uh, energy at the source of the data center power running. That is the thing we have to talk to ERC. I think this, this uh, webinar, I think will be the topic that I will take this chance to, to discuss with them as well. I, I, Dr. Kanchit, go with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. Uh, there's a question from Mario. I better quickly clear. Okay, okay. They're still yeah, coming yeah. a lot. Save. Yeah, sorry. So uh, Mario has a question about mixing hydrogen. Is it safe to use? So on a fuel cell basis, it's two different things. So 
uh, the, the, the fuel cell for, for uh, natural gas is constructed very differently from the fuel cell from hydrogen. So uh, a fuel cell has to be dedicated. It's either a hydrogen-based fuel cell or a, uh, a, a natural gas-based fuel cell. So you can't mix the gas in that sense. It's not about safety. It's about the way the, the fuel cell works. I hope that's the, 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 the question. But uh, I know that uh, the key challenges of gas, uh, not just hydrogen, but whether you natural gas or anything to do with gas, uh, to, is the transportation from source to the end user. And that's the most dangerous part of the whole process. So you need to find a correct way. And most of them today are being done in gas pipeline. And, and, and therefore, there are countries that are actually trying out to see if they can deliver the hydrogen and the natural gas on the same pipeline. And at the source, they split it up. So this is definitely some, I'm aware that some of the countries are ex exploring to be able to use the same infrastructure they deliver natural gas. Also in the future, if hydrogen becomes the fuel of the, of the future, then they could leverage the use of that infrastructure that already exists that support uh, gas distribution. Uh, separately, the safest way to transport gas actually is in solid form. And there are many, uh, there's a one major researcher in the Singapore University who has uh, perfected a methodology that will allow you to, to, to actually solidify hydrogen. And when you, have, when you solidify a gas, that's the safest way to transport it. So I, I will say that in this area of gas technology moving forward, there are many research in different area that's being done in order to understand the entire supply chain process. I hope that answers your question, uh, uh, Ma Ma Mario. Mario. Um, uh, what I want to do is uh, there's one more question on, very quickly, again, on, uh, where is it? Uh, um, fuel, fuel, fuel cell, where is it? It's gone. Uh, they have Raymond, Raymond V. Uh, 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 Raymond V. Yes, yeah. I saw it. Yeah. They talk about HFC, hydrogen fuel cell. Yeah, uh, how to educate people or customer to use HFC? Um, no, I, I think it's not uh, Raymond. A uh, uh, good question. It, it is a. Uh, it is not about. Uh, uh, actually, it's not about fuel cell. It's about renewable energy. How important. In the future, does the customer pay attention to renewable energy? And some of this will be motivated by policy changes, especially carbon tax and all that. So companies are going to be, uh, uh, I think uh, Abeha did a very good job in explaining within Schneider that you got to judge the, the dollar. So if you're going to be taxed for, for not using renewable energy, then the motivation to going into uh, fuel cell technology is essentially driven by fundamental costs. Uh, so Raymond, I hope that, that you, 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 could, uh, you could you could can understand that. But basically, uh, chi China does have a lot of the pro 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 uh, product for hydrogen and that uh, do fuel cell stacks and everything else. The key, by the way, in hydrogen deployment is two area. How can a user like a data center be able to safely receive continuous hydrogen, which is a fuel, and, and therefore operate it in a manner. And, and at the cost that is, uh, a, a, at a cost that works, we cannot be too high cost. Uh, most companies will be prepared to pay for a higher energy cost in order to be renewable. But I don't think we can del deliver a sustainable business if the cost is twice that of any energy cost. So on that basis, I, I hope uh, you understand, Raymond, that this is a, a bit complicated. We need to spend time to understand the technology and to understand the cost effectiveness from a economic basis as well as a desired basis. So that's how this, this will, but I, I sincerely believe that hydrogen as a fuel it is will be adopted and, and we already seen that australia has adopted it the europeans are definitely very much into hydrogen as a fuel and recently the japanese government has also signed up to that um, um singapore my government here singapore my country uh, we are now making a consideration but i haven't heard any update yet on, on whether hydrogen will be a fuel of the future for us from a renewable basis all right 
Okay. Um, uh, I hope that answers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, another to support Kevin. Uh, actually, they have another option rather than you install the hydrogen fuel cells in your data center. So if you are hyperscale data center that to require 100 megawatt, they have another option in the future if hydrogen is cheaper because hydrogen power plant. So it can become like, like that option as well. But they have many questions. Are uh, hydrogen power plant is safe or not? That will be another question again, right? So they still have a question to uh, Dr. Kanchit. Oh, okay. You, you see that one? So what? Uh, what is the question? Bilawan. Oh, okay. Uh, about the installation of pump storage, right? Yep. As uh, I already mentioned, now we have uh, two, uh, two sides of pump solid install, uh, the 100% pump solid in at Lam Kong and another two at uh, uh, Pumipon Hydro Power Pan and Sinekalin Hydro Power Pan. And um, that's it, the existing one uh, that we are uh, going. But the question is, the um, in um, I just need to, to, to tell that, uh, according to my slide, we are planning to install one pump solid in um, Turapon uh, Hydro Power Pan in Chaipum Povin. That's it, the project that uh, we are going to to um, to start. But uh, there are many uh, existing that we are, there are many of them that we are already study, like a kind of uh, feasibility study. Uh, and all of them located in certain part of Thailand, like in Vachala, Vachala Longkorn dams and uh, Sinakalin dam as well. So we are planning to do that. Okay. Uh, they have There's a very interesting question from uh, Tera Singha. Is that right? Did I get it right? Yeah, yeah. Tera Singha. Uh, uh, Tara, Tara, you you have a very interesting question. It, it, but unfortunately, it's nothing to do with renewable energy. Uh, this is the, the the area that you're asking is is really the major area of future improvement uh, between data center operator and their customer. But in order to do some of these things that you're talking about, uh, the ability to to separate the different type of power to be delivered to the different workload, whether it's a server workload, storage workload, or, or uh, or, um, or network workload. Um, there are there is a major trial going on in Europe. I can't mention it with uh, with the in in uh, Sweet, uh, actually in Scandinavia country. Uh, we are looking at it as well, whereby uh, we are trying to connect the uh, electrical infrastructure to understand more and respond to the IT infrastructure needs and requirements. So that's the first step towards what you're talking about, because to do this. Um, this, we need to know, we know how much the server is using, but today the electrical system don't care, just deliver, if the customer say I want 11 kilowatt per rack, I just give 11 kilowatt. I do not, uh, I do not respond to the load, I give the fixed load, and then the server and the equipment take up that load. Anything that's not taken up be becomes a wasted energy. Um, there is a discussion and project going on whereby we're using software to control the load deployment. It is all technically feasible because we are collecting enough information on digitized type UPSs that I can vary the load. But this is a completely new area. Um, not many, it won't be deployable uh, until much later when we've implemented a little bit more smarter capability to do real-time analysis of the load demand from the rack and in, in directing the, the energy to be responding to the kind of load the uh, each rack will require. Um, interesting question because it is about the future, but it's got nothing to do with renewable energy. <laughs> okay, I thought okay. that. Yeah, okay, compliment yeah. uh, Wong. I think this is very interesting in terms of how you define your design philosophy for a data center, right? So it has to be decided yeah. while you're planning for your data center. And there are possibilities uh, to actually segregate loads and we can also look at how to, uh, you know, uh, optimize. Because if you see in data center, the most of power consumption happens from cooling system, right? So there are technologies which are available to control cooling, to ensure that they are load-based uh, cooling utilization. And of course, as you rightly mentioned, uh, there are some technology developments which are happening on the 
the software layer where uh, you can really run AI, automate all the operations in terms of how to match the IT requirements to, to, to uh, scaling, upscaling or downscaling the, the power and cooling requirements. But of course, it has nothing to do with, uh, <coughs> but it's a very interesting topic to consider while you are really designing and planning a data center. Yeah, uh, just for support, Abe, it depends on the tier design as well or class of the data center. If you design for tier four data center, definitely you have double more equipment, right? It's not safe for the energy. We cannot talk about high reliability with low energy consumption. That is not the right way, right? But we need more high reliability. So that's why we duplicate more equipment like two N plus one, for example. If you got for in, you got risk more on the equipment. You cannot take it all, right? That's the concept. Yes. You have to pay for something. I think they still have the, uh, the question that Kun Cha Wa Mon, Dr. Kanchit, they asking about the uh, hydropower in large Gabang industrial estate. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, uh, yeah. some some situation about the location, I think uh, you can answer this question. I'm not so sure that uh, I can answer your question, but uh, the sim simplest way is like uh, we need uh, for hydropower. That means we need to to find a place, <laughs> and uh, I'm not so sure that we can find such kind of that. Uh, uh, appropriate paid code to Ratabang or not, I mean, in, in, in my idea. But I think there are many ways to do that, like uh, like what I mentioned. We, maybe we need to search for like uh, such a kind of uh, education uh, uh, channel or education dam that belong to Royal Education Department that uh, uh, this is so part of uh, some hydropower development that we are doing that uh, many years ago with a uh, Royal Education Department that we implemented like kind of small hydropower in, in, in just one channel of education, uh, channel that uh, operate by, by that uh, Royal Education Department. So maybe uh, my answer is we have to look for the nearest uh, Royal Education Dam close to that area and uh, we can do that approach or maybe Yes, in the near future, uh, like uh, if we can uh, use uh, such, kind, uh, such kind of the technology that I just proposed, we can ensure that we can uh, trace with the source of generation, especially hydropower generation to, to your site. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, 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 Dr. Kossit, uh, Dr. Dr. Montri, sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. There was a question uh, on biogas. Uh, I, I just want to clarify. Biogas is technically not renewable. It, it, it's got carbon footprint in it. But there are, uh, there are processes today that uh, can, uh, I think in uh, Thailand, biogas is being used to create an electricity in order to, be, to, pro, to, to generate hydrogen. And uh, when you use uh, carbon-based um, electricity to generate uh, hydrogen, it's called brown hydrogen. There are three classes of hydrogen that you can buy in the market today. Brown hydrogen, uh, uh, blue hydrogen, and, and green hydrogen. Green is generated by renewable power. Brown mm -hmm. is where you are generating it and you haven't taken off the carbon. Uh, so right. uh, so that, that, that's brown. Now there's a thing called blue hydrogen. There is a process that is led by the Australian, I believe, and, and many other countries are following it, whereby you can take an, uh, you can take brown hydrogen, which has carbon base, and you can strip, basically you strip from natural gas or from biogas, you strip the carbon to create some graphite byproduct. That stripping process is a chemical process that exists today. It is an extra cost, but it gives you a byproduct. So it takes away the carbon from your biogas and your natural gas before you turn it into hydrogen. And that is called blue, blue hydrogen. So the prices of these hydrogen are, are different. Green hydrogen is of course the most expensive. Brown hydrogen is the cheapest, but you're not, you're not taking away the carbon and then you still have blue hydrogen. So I hope that explains to the, gen, the person who asked the question about biogas. 
I, I'm aware that in Thailand, there's a lot of these guys that are using biogas to now create hydrogen. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay Abe, they have one question from Peter Lomberg. You got that one? About the cooling system. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, again, this is nothing related with uh, internal energy, but of course, it's a key criteria for uh, data center efficiency, right? And uh, yes, uh, what we have seen usually for the for overall power consumption, when you break it down, other than IT load, if you look at the, the most of the power consumption is done by cooling systems, right? And it really impacts the, the, the power consumption of the uh, data center. And yes, this is one of the area where we need to look at there are multiple technologies available right now, even in the chill water, uh, close couple cooling, or, or, or chill water open up open cooling. So there are many technologies available on the compressor side. And we also are deploying a few of the uh, indirect evaporative cooling technologies, which are again working in a different uh, concept of using uh, uh, atmospheric dry uh, bulb temperature difference. And with that, we can really control the, the overall capacity of the cooling. And then on top, there is also a, a, a software layer which works in, uh, in artificial intelligence. Where in fact, as I mentioned in your data center, if you have specific areas, as, as the servers will not consume the 100% power every time. So they are not like uh, running at high speed all the time. So depending on the peak load sharing, we can, we can also control the cooling of data center by deploying the sensors and the uh, AI, uh, AI metrics to ensure that we can run specific cooling in, uh, cooling in the room. And if you don't really need that cooling in the room, we can shut it down so that which can give you more power efficiency in the data center. So hope uh, I'm able to answer that. Yeah, uh, I have additional on Abe because I have the research on the, in the big data center, you may not know which server is idle server or not. Do we, do we have to scan to the traffic that happen with this server? And most of them, they, they eat more power, but they not perform anything. So you need to find out this one as well. Uh, even though you have to consider about uh, many data center, they talk about the DX and the cooling, uh, cheap, cheap water, which one is much more efficiency, right? That you have to come back at the designer, at the designer point. So what we have usually seen below 200 kilowatt, uh, I mean, you, you need to look at all the aspects like commercially as well as from an efficiency standpoint. So when you look at the, somewhere between 200 kilowatt uh, data center, 200 kilowatt data center, IT power or less, usually DX becomes more and more uh, uh, subjective. But of course, when it goes beyond that, uh, we need to look at how we can define different cooling strategies within the data center. For a larger scale data centers, of course, uh, it becomes a different ball game where we need to look at how, how we can mix the air properly so that we don't need to, need to put pressure on the, on the cooling system and power. So, yeah, there are different strategies can be discussed. And again, it comes to during design phase. Okay, I may answer this one. Uh, is the government of Thailand going to provide more uh, regulations toward energy uses in data center? The answer is no, because uh, I, I work with, uh, we call digital government agency, we tie to uh, do what we call data center consolidations and we try to force them to do the PUE, but uh, we have uh, many, many issues about this one. So this one must be considered by the department of uh, DE uh, because these are economies about this issue. Okay, but I, I, I used to uh, make a research for them on this topic. And I think they have another question coming up, uh, Dr. Kanchit. Uh, Saharat, Kun Saharat. Yeah. I think uh, Kun Saharat uh, asking for for uh, all of us to to think about another mechanism. That I uh, uh, I also agree with him that uh, 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 renewable energy can free directly from um, by using the uh, ERC or Renewable Energy Certificate mechanism. This uh, is another uh, possibility. Yeah, yeah, that, that is, is, this is my research as well because mm -hmm. that, that, that's why we have today discussion about this one because if the data center in Thailand, right, 
used the, the intention to use a renewable energy, what the benefit they will get, right? Yeah, that's so right. that's why I, I talked at the first when I speak about virtual PPA, right? And the renewable energy credits, right? But for this, we need to uh, get deep into the ERC to discuss with them uh, mm -hmm. what the benefit the data center they will get if they got this certificate. Because for example, I have negotiation which could one rush them, for example, and I want to purchase about 10 megawatt from them. So they have their virtual purchasing agreement, but at the end, they have to talk with ECAP, right? <laughs> and I talk to, to PEA as well, right? So that is mainly the step we have to, to, to talk, discuss about. I think we will have the second, <laughs> Second webinar is about this one after we got this kind of uh, agreement or idea or conceptual about how to make the, from the generation distribution until the end user blockchain will be the answer to yeah, that's right. lock them that's up it. together. Right? This is one of a uh, uh, feasible technology that we can trace uh, all information from, from upstream to downstream like a from Supply to supply side to to demand side and also the flow of uh, information in between. And is RAC is also one of a uh, uh, key that can use can also uh, use such as this technology. Uh, I will cut part of my research paper to Kun uh, Sarat uh, so everyone can see it. Okay. Okay. Good. It's already sent. I'm not sure. Where is it? I thought that did you see my, my typing? No, no. So uh, I will share on the uh, message to every audience so they yes, can see yes. it. Yes, yes, yes. That's a good thing. So while you're typing, Dr. Montre, just to com complement what, what you said by uh, on regards to blockchain, I'm uh, in Singapore. Singapore Power is working on a piece of software that will enable end user to determine the source of uh, energy, where it's coming from, so that we know what percentage is renewable, what percentage is not. So they are using blockchain to be able to trace the contract all the way down to source. So that's a consistent strategy, I believe, uh, or, or approach. Oh, okay. Uh, I think Kutplang, the, the question is gone. I didn't see where is it. Uh, it will be on the message, on the uh, chat. Not, not on the Q&A, right? No, yes, it should it's be on, on the chat. This is on the chat. Oh. It's on the chat. I saw that. Okay, I uh, will type in the answer. Okay. Okay, it's already got, I sent already. Okay, everyone see the, 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 the answer, right? That's yeah, why that's we right. use the word virtual, right? You can be any on the grid, you can consume the power and we have agreed together, we use that. Okay, from my sentence. That's that we talk about renewable energy credits associated with clean energy. So generate or in one place to whatever grid energy is consumed in another, right? Mm -hmm. Making the grid energy carbon neutral. So that, that is the idea of the uh, virtual power purchasing agreement and uh, uh, energy uh, renewable energy credit concept in the future that will use the capability of Bitcoin to tracking and traceable. Okay, I think we have uh, all done on the questions, right? Yes, I hope so. I'm not sure that we missed some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not sure we missed some questions or not. Okay, but I think that we consume a lot of time and I, I believe if we have a good response, I try to make the, if we have a chance to make a, the second 
uh, of uh, the uh, renewable energy for data center, I will, but uh, for the hydrogen, we already have, right? Because I set up this one with Dr. Kanchit, and I think we'll soon we will have the hydrogen panel discussion webinar as well. Okay. Uh, for at the end, uh, Kabe, do you have anything to say just a few minutes before we leave? No, um, very, thank you very much. And I, I, I'm so delighted to have such an active audience and, and a great panel to, to work with. I've learned, I learned a lot of things about Thailand as well while I'm doing this thing. So once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Monastery, for inviting me to this panel. I'm very honored. And I look forward to uh, building a successful renewable energy data center in, in Bangkok soon, my friend. Okay. Sure, sure. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Kun, uh, Dr. Kanchit, do you have anything to the audience before we leave? Yes. Uh, as I already mentioned that uh, this is one of uh, another approach that we can uh, use uh, for a renewable energy source in, in Thailand, especially for the big uh, for the big demand like data center. Uh, as uh, in, technic, uh, in technical point of view, we can do that, but we still need uh, to, um, to get the uh, more flexible of a recreation that we can do that. But uh, anyway, anything needs to be fair to all stakeholders, this is, this is the main point. And if there is anything that concerns with uh, energy in blockchain, I am also one of the working group for uh, IEEE &E standard uh, for blockchain in energy transaction that we are going to release the first version by the end of this year, I hope so. And um, if there is any update on that, you can contact me or maybe I will share in some, in yeah. some activity. Okay, Thank, how about you. Abe, you have any for the audience? No, I think it was, uh, as Kevin mentioned, I, I, I second that. In fact, it was a, it was a great session and a very good participation. And I'm, I'm also thoroughly honored to, to chair the, share the panel with, with, uh, with the experts like you. And definitely uh, from the Schneider side, as you can see, uh, we have our own commitments to meet the, uh, the sustainability requirement. And of course, renewable energy is one of the key topic, part of uh, sustainability criteria. And we are here in Thailand to support uh, any of their needs uh, right from uh, right from looking at strategy to plan to execute to operate so we can support in all the interventions and of course with the help of uh, the distinguished panels we can also looking forward to see how we can create uh, more and more sustainable data centers in thailand of course there was one question where does thailand look at uh, uh, does, does thailand see data center as an issue for power so we are, in fact, uh, Thailand is super ready, as, as Dr. Uh, Kachit has already mentioned. We have all the tools for uh, big data centers to, to place in, that, in Thailand. So you're all welcome in Thailand. Sorry, Dr. Kachit, I take uh, on your behalf. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, no problem. For all the audience and for all the data center investor, I think uh, we, I, I saw my uh, potential, uh, country potentials that uh, we have firm for renewable energy almost five gigawatt. And we have about seven gigawatt for a non-firm like a solar or wind. But there still have plenty of room for investors to come to invest in Thailand, especially we have the EEC zone that uh, the BOI, they have the regulations if you want to invest the data center more than uh, 3,000 square meter, you can get the tax exemption about eight years and you can get extend another five years. That means almost 13 years. And the power for renewable is ready for you. For my research, we have almost about 500 megawatt that for the data center consumption inside Thailand. So in the future can getting bigger, but this first uh, webinar of us, we will uh, try to create the more conceptual and then get more real about the uh, uh, virtual power purchasing agreement and the uh, renewable energy credit. I think make it come true within soon or later. Okay, thank you for all. And I will pass the, the state to Kun Prime, okay?
Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Montre, for the radio session. And also, I would like to thank you all the speakers for such a very informative and very useful webinar we have today. So it's two hours that we um, uh, for for the whole sessions, and I think a lot of questions is uh, come came in. So I would like to thank the our uh, organization partners uh, for today's webinar, the King Mungkut uh, Institute of Technology, Lat Kabang, and also the Hopora Data Center University (OIG), and also the Joy Career School of uh, uh, of Energy and Envi Environment, the King Mungkut University. University of Technology Thonburi. And of course, we would like to thank you for the Shanaida Electric for being the sponsor of this webinar. So at the end, I would like to um, uh, remind you to join our uh, online activities, uh, online events that we are going to have. In uh, We are going to have the ASEAN Sustainable Energy Week uh, in the virtual editions. So we, it will be on 14 to 16 of October um, this year. So the activity is to be include the virtual online marketplace, which you can build the uh, exhibitors technology solutions on the renewable energy, on the, uh, on the EV, on the data center and solutions. So uh, it start on 27th of September. And during 14 to 16 of October, there will be the webinar re uh, related to the topic uh, that is going on. So especially for the Thai um, audience that is in our web webinar today. So we will have the webinar on the 15th of uh, October, which is organized by uh, Dr. Montri and also the uh, King Sumungkut Institute of Technology, like Rabang. It will be about the uh, AI and 5G for the uh, evolutions of data center on the 15th October, starting from 9 a.m. until uh, the afternoon, 3 p.m. So I would like to uh, Dr. Montre to uh, give us a little bit of uh, information about this webinar. Okay, uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, artificial intelligence, we come to replace the human and to make more efficiencies about the data center operations and the 5G technology we use will stimulate more people used about the IoT. So that means the transaction we will hit into data center right now. And even though in the COVID crisis, many people work from home, online from home. So the cloud service provider get more heavy load about this one. So in that day, we will be uh, have more detail about the technology we changed, what, how we can handle and the evolution of technology inside the data center themselves, how make more efficiencies. That's all about that today. Uh, I would like to invite all of you to join us as well. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Munti. So uh, for more information of the event and other uh, conference on uh, the ASEAN Sustainable Energy Week virtual editions, uh, please follow the, our online uh, uh, social media and also from the website and we will keep updating our information and also you can do the pre-registrations on the website as well so today i think uh, we have to end the uh, webinar now so uh, i thank you everyone for staying with us until now and i hope uh, everybody uh, stay safe during this pandemic yes so and we will come back again next time thank you okay, thank you everyone bye bye thank you